Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's called Overcoming Commoditization of Metals. My name is Chris Marty, and I'm the VP of Data Analytics and Executive Education at MSCI. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a couple of housekeeping items so you'll know how to participate in today's webinar. You're looking at a screenshot of the Zoom attendee interface. You should see something that looks very much like this on your computer, your phone, or your uh, tablet right now. By default, you're listening to your computer's audio, but you can change to a dial-up if you'd like to, if your audio isn't doing well on the computer by using the audio settings box on the lower left of the Zoom interface. It'll give you a whole bunch of Zoom phone numbers you can dial in on. Also wanna let you know that to minimize distractions and the background noise on this webinar, your microphone is going to be muted for the entire webinar and likewise your camera will be off. Um, that's just again so that we can pay attention and focus on the content on today's presentation. You're gonna have the opportunity throughout the webinar to submit questions to our presenters in the Zoom interface. And I would encourage you to please submit questions anytime they occur to you, because we can collect them as we go along and then we can answer them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. So please don't hesitate to submit your questions. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters today. They are from McMahon and Ransford, which is a knowledge transfer firm that helps clients answer their most pressing problems. They work in partnership side by side with clients to realize and sustain results. McMahon and Ransford has the experience, the intellectual property and the proprietary tools to enable a highly effective go to market strategy, which is um, in a lot of ways what our presentation is about today. So there are three presenters, Jackie McMahon, Mark Slotnick, and Anthony Paluska, and all of those three will play a part in today's webinar. So welcome to the McMahon and Ransford team. Thank you, Chris. So this is Jackie McMahon speaking. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Like Chris mentioned, I am joined by two of my colleagues, Mark Slotnick and Anthony Paluska, who you heal from a little bit as well. Um, we're very excited to share the results from a study that we conducted last year. So before we start getting into that, I do wanna provide a little bit of background in addition to what you know, Chris just shared about McMahon and Ransford and really what the impetus for this study was. So at McMahon and Ransford, we specialize in helping B2B companies overcome the commoditization of their products and services. So that usually involves adopting a sustainable business model that's really built around becoming a strategic partner to their clients and solving their market's most pressing issues. So really it's about becoming indispensable to their clients and their markets. So, I mean, if you think about it, even leaders in innovation eventually find themselves forced to change and adapt as the market starts to catch up with them. And one thing that we were particularly interested in is understanding how those strategies that these you know, market leaders across all industries are using to differentiate themselves, seeing how they apply to a market that's actually anchored around a commodity such as metals. So we've conducted a study of the metals industry. Like I said, we conducted this last year and we are specifically focused on you know, understanding how those strategies are being used in this industry to stand out from the competition, achieve premium pricing, better margins, greater customer loyalty. So we interviewed a handful of buyers and sellers across the industry of all shapes and sizes. And just to kind of ground us in those terms, because you'll hear them quite a bit, buyers and sellers, as we go through both this presentation and also included in our report. Um, so when we talk about buyers, what we really mean are companies that are purchasing large quantities of metals, be it be steel, aluminum, copper, and even more specifically, um, the individuals that we interviewed within those companies were the decision makers, right? So um, key executives or for the smaller companies, your CEOs and your owners. 
And then for the sellers, obviously that's anyone selling metals. And again, it's those decision makers. So it was sales leaders or um, those owners and CEOs. So we want to, to share some of those results with you all today. And actually we wanna share two particular strategies that we heard um, that we thought were really interesting and worth exploring further. So it's all about how um, these sellers are differentiating themselves. But before we start getting into those results, I, there's a question that's burning in my mind and I'm sure it's burning in a lot of people's mind. And, and I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Mark. But so the question really is, how does differentiation apply in a COVID-19 or a post-COVID-19 environment? Um, it just during this time, I, I can imagine that that is what a lot of people are thinking as we touch on these topics. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark and, and he can talk you through our perspective of the COVID-19 impact. Thank you, Jackie. And thanks again to all of you that have taken the time to be with us today. Um, as, as Jackie said, our, our firm works with lots of different clients in many, many industries and specific to the COVID topic. Um, there are some common themes that are um, playing out, at least in our experience, that um, regardless of industry, um, a couple of key things. One, uh, COVID and, and this situation is causing a squeeze, if, you, if I can call it that, on their business. And the need for change is both faster and being much more intensified. And in our experience um, in these industries, most are taking the point of view at this point in time to evaluate, you know, quote unquote, their old way of operating and interacting with customers, which is really being translated into um, key decisions and action planning for where and how to invest for changes they want and need to make. And a lot of those changes, by the way, were things that they had planned to do, but now is becoming accelerated to implement them. And another big change is what to um, uh, consider for retaining as a best practice in a, um, you know, a, a go forward situation. We don't have cold hard facts and data on this, but we are anticipating the same for a lot of you on this call, if not all of you, in that now's the time, if you haven't begun, you're probably about to, um, as an organization, self-reflect on how to add value in the current situation with your markets, whether you are a partner or quote unquote, a vendor. And lastly, are you being indispensable to your customers? And those are all interrelated. Those are things we're gonna cover um, uh, in a few minutes here. And our request at this point is to just keep this in mind, speed, acceleration, and freedom to think about ways to change the way you all operate. Because as we share our findings, um, it's our point of view that these strategies are um, being accelerated and um, talked about more and more, even though we conducted this study um, in 2019. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jackie. Great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I think that's really helpful. And I think that, I mean, my key takeaway from that is now is the perfect time to talk about some of the findings from last year, because it's just as important, if not more important than ever, to be thinking about how you're going to differentiate yourselves. Um, so I'll, I'll go through some of the summary findings and I want to ground us in some of the key questions that, that we, M&R, had going into this study. What were the hypotheses that we were seeking to understand? Um, so the first one is, do buyers in this market want more from their vendors? So we believed we might find a discrepancy between what the market desires and what the typical seller is actually providing. And we see that quite frequently in other industries as well. And the second question is, are there opportunities to differentiate beyond just price, availability of product, and personal relationships, which you will hear us refer to as PAR, again, both in, in this presentation as well as the study itself. So while PAR, especially price and product availability, are, are very crucial components and they're not gonna go away, they have, or at least will soon become, essentially table stakes. So we hypothesize that there might be opportunities to win business based on other factors as well, despite this being a commodity. 
So taking that first question, what was really interesting is we didn't have a definitive yes. As you can see in the top right graph that I just put on the screen, only a fourth of buyers when asked if they wanted more than the current products, if they were looking for more value from their sellers, only a fourth responded that, that they were interested in those value add type of things. But when we prompted those that responded that they were not interested with specific examples, so that's things like value add processing, insights on upcoming pricing variations, um, industry specific expertise, advisory services, um, those sorts of things. When, when we prompted them with those, many buyers actually changed their response. And you can see 78% of those who initially said no became interested once they heard those examples. And just to further illustrate a little bit of that misalignment between buyers and sellers, in the second graph, you can see there was one large discrepancy that was the value of personal relationships. So think about the R and PAR. Um, we asked both sellers and buyers whether their personal relationships were important enough that buyers would follow an individual sales rep if they left to work at a competitor. And the discrepancy, like I said, was pretty significant. So you can see 43% of sellers um, believe that their key customers would follow them if they left. But on the other side, 87% of buyers claimed they would stay with their current vendor even if their point of contact left. So all of this kind of tells us that, that there is an opportunity for sellers to bring more to their buyers, um, aside from you know, personal relationships and, and the other elements of PAR. But the thing is that it's not expected today. And from what we've seen, buyers and sellers in this industry have really become accustomed to the status quo and making decisions based on those PAR levers. So in our minds, we think there may be some blind spots to the possibilities that could actually change the dynamic between the buyer-seller relationship. So like I referenced before, there were two specific strategies that jumped out to us that we heard from um, sellers that they're using today that we thought were worth diving into further. So we're gonna spend the next portion of the, web the webinar on those two strategies. So the first one, is viewing and treating buyers the way they view themselves. So this is about applying in-depth knowledge of the industry segments you're in to differentiate yourselves in the market. The other strategy is moving up the value chain. So this is about getting closer to the end customer by collapsing the supply chain. So like I said, we're gonna spend some time diving into each one of those. Um, Mark and myself will both share more detail on each strategy. We'll share some of the study findings that support each one and some key examples that we heard, as well as the implications of each strategy. Um, each one requires some form of investment for it to be successful. And from what we've heard from the sellers we spoke to, um, we've kind of categorized those and want to share them. So taking that first strategy, like I've said, Opportunities do exist, but the market really hasn't reached the point where buyers are actively seeking out additional help or services. So sellers really need to be the ones driving that effort and proactively bringing solutions to their customers. And some of the sellers that we spoke to are opting to leverage advice and guidance as that differentiator. And they've actually seen uh, quite a bit of success with this strategy. So if you think about it, in a market that's highly competitive and diverse, these sellers are segmenting this broad target market into groups of buyers that have similar needs, objectives, and priorities, and are applying their knowledge of these segments to actually differentiate themselves. So basically, they seem to understand that the market has too many potential buyers to treat each one of them the same, you know, they're very unique. There's different industries, different sizes. Um, but also it's too many to be able to sustainably develop unique strategies for each one on an individual basis. So from what we've seen, the key to making this successful is those sellers in-depth understanding of the different, you know, industry segments, verticals that their buyers are in. 
as well as other demographic factors, like I mentioned size or geography. And this approach ultimately allowed the sellers that we spoke to, to actually act in an advisory capacity and become more of a partner, less of a vendor to their customers. And I mean, even further, it allowed them to begin to prioritize their limited resources where they can have the most impact. It allowed them to tailor the way that they communicate to their customers based on what segment that customer is in. It allowed them to um, invest in products and services that actually enable the business of their key customers and key segments. And then ultimately providing that advice, right? That guidance to their key segments and, and that enhanced focus on really solving the business problems that their customers are facing and becoming a little bit more indispensable to them. So I wanna go through some of those key findings that really support this approach. So first of all, do buyers actually want this? Are they looking for this type of advice and guidance? And if so, how often are they actually receiving it? And so as you can see in the graph, 83% of buyers, when asked if they would be interested, responded that they would appreciate this type of advice. But only 20% of those who were open to it are actually receiving it. And then if you look at what the sellers told us, so we asked sellers, what type of advice are you providing to your buyers? And 66, they responded and said they're providing advice, but only related to their products. And then 17% are providing no advice at all. And the remaining 17% are providing advice beyond their products. And that's really what we're talking about. It's more than helping to guide your customers to you know, the right products for them, but it's actually going above and beyond and understanding their strategic objectives and be able to partner with them to help them reach their goals. So based on this, um, it just further shows that discrepancy between what the market is asking for and what they're getting. And it really highlights a huge opportunity for sellers to differentiate themselves by going above and beyond and being able to you know, guide their, their customers through their own growth journeys. So I wanna talk you through uh, a particular example that we heard that, that I found particularly interesting. So we'll call them Company X. But Company X is a relatively new organization that actually built their business around this concept. The, the impetus for starting the company was originally to help one particular customer take advantage of an opportunity. So Company X actually purchased machinery that their customer needed, but only needed 50% of the production time. So they were able to um, broaden their customer base and actually continue to gain broad insights into their customer's objective needs and priorities, because that's the way that they got started. And they naturally just began focusing on segments of the market that shared those same characteristics, those same priorities and objectives. And that just in turn enhanced their knowledge of the segments even further. Um, so they were able to leverage all of that knowledge to begin advising their customers and prospects. And that advice, in addition to just overall operational excellence, really allowed them to win in a highly competitive market, even though their standard prices were quite a bit higher than their competitors. So today, that company, their infrastructure is really built around this segment focused mentality. They have five segments that they're focused on and organized internally around. They have a transactional outside sales team that's supported by industry focused subject matter experts. And these experts, of course, are providing that advisory sales techniques, right? They're providing guidance and, um, and that advice that we've been talking about. And those some examples of that include sharing best practices of what others are in the industry are doing. So a little bit of benchmarking, um, as well as assisting with things like cost benefit analyses on decisions like whether the customer should invest in new machinery or product lines. So in addition to just overall, you know, succeeding in the market, this approach allowed this particular seller 
to begin forecasting demand in line with the goals of their customers, those growth goals, and becoming that strategic partner rather than just a vendor, differentiating themselves um, from their competitors on factors other than PAR, and of course, prioritizing and focusing their sales efforts in the areas of the market where they believe they have the most impact. So ultimately, this resulted in more loyal customers, higher margins, and greater predictability of sales. So as you can tell from that example, there are definitely business implications to this strategy. There are investments that need to be made for this to be successful. And I want to talk you through a handful of categories of what those implications look like. So let's start with talent. Um, from what we've seen and what we've heard, um, having the right talent is going to be key to success. And a lot of, of the sellers we spoke to that are utilizing this strategy are investing in market-facing talent that have, A, advisory capabilities. So the ability to engage in consultative selling, the ability to provide guidance to executive level customers, and develop those valuable, sustainable relationships and then in-depth industry expertise, right? So to be able to provide that guidance, you really need to know the industry that your customers are in. You know, for example, oil and gas or automotive. Um, so talent was definitely a key thing that we heard about. Another piece was the actual structure. So like in the example I just gave, a lot of sellers end up organizing themselves internally around the segments that they're serving. And specifically, that starts with your market-facing resources, your sales and your account management, because it really allows those reps to focus on and can you continue to develop knowledge in those key areas. And the other piece to structure is investing in new product lines that actually fill the gaps in seller's ability to serve the markets that they're in. And this just entrenches them further into their customer's business and become even more vertically aligned internally. And the last piece, we heard loud and clear that one of the most important pieces of making this strategy work is customer and market data. The entire strategy is built on knowledge and without an effective way, to compile and manage that data, the efforts really aren't as optimal as you'd like them to be. And you won't receive all the results. You'll find that it's happening in pockets and it's not as deliberate as you'd like. So that, I mean, those three categories of implications cover the majority of kind of the investments in the beginning you would make or that we've heard that sellers are making to embark on that first strategy. Um, and I want to hand it over to my colleague, Mark, to discuss the second strategy, moving up the value chain. So, Mark, I'll go ahead and, and let you take over. Thank you, Jackie. And I know we're, we're throwing a lot of information and data at you quickly. So just as a quick refresh, we had two questions we were seeking to answer when we started the study. Question one was, do the buyers in the market want more than they are getting from their vendors? And question two, again, are there opportunities to differentiate when business based on factors other than what we're calling PAR? One of the differentiation strategies to address these questions is what we call, you know, moving up the value chain, but many others call it collapsing the supply chain. It's a deliberate strategy, a deliberate plan, and a deliberate set of actions that gets a company closer to the end consumer of its products. As you can imagine, being successful with this strategy allows your company to become more and more embedded into your ecosystem, which makes it harder for your customer to disentangle that relationship. In other words, this strategy moves you from a vendor supplier, if you will, to being an seen and treated more as a partner. We do want to make an important distinction here about the use of the value chain versus supply chain definition because we found um, they're often used interchangeably, yet there are some subtle um, but important nuances. So as you can see on the screen here, supply chain is the sequence of processes involved in the production and distribution of a commodity. 
Value chain is the process of activities by which a company adds value to an article, including production, marketing, and the provision of after-sales uh, service. And, and we could keep going on. There's many different definition variations, and we don't want to dissect them all here. But we do strongly believe that the important takeaway between the two is the following. And we, we actually heard uh, the folks that we talked to somewhat fall into this. And so, for example, if you see your business as being and operating in the supply chain, the chances are very high that you are seen and therefore treated as a supply chain vendor. However, if you see your business as being in and operating within the value chain, then the chances are very high that you're being seen and treated as a partner. In other words, the, the mentality and the mindset of where you find yourself and think you fall into this sequence of um, uh, in the diagram there is somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy regarding the market's view and treatment of that business. So um, again, the, th this notion of collapsing and moving up, whatever we want to call it, um, is a best practice employed by a lot of successful and fast growing companies in your industry. It's also similar to large corporate enterprises and in other industries that have become dominant in their markets and more resistant to competition. So let's take a look at some of the data and findings that uh, we, we have to support the strategy. As you can see on the screen, when asked about whether their suppliers know or understand their business, two thirds of buyers said no. In addition, 83% of those buyer respondents believe it would be helpful and beneficial. Clearly, there's an opportunity for those of us that sell to do better at understanding their customers' true business and business needs. And that knowledge is key to taking advantage of this opportunity and beating the competition. As you know, buyers have become more demanding and want more sophisticated outcomes from who they buy from. In other words, buyers want to buy outcomes. How you define outcome might be a little bit um, up to you and who you're interacting with, but the point being, they're focused on the outcome of what it is you're providing. And from our study, we learned that many buyers would prefer a more finished product that better met their needs. Again, a big opportunity is available, but I, I do want to call out the fact that we should, um, I suggest, we define the term product more broadly, and let's think of it as more of a solution rather than just the metal. Because again, as Jackie mentioned earlier, um, once we prod and define and describe what it is ultimately, we didn't want to lead the witness in the interviews, but the fact that they immediately attached product to a, a metal and then when we expanded that a little bit, um, they were able to more clearly answer uh, in terms of outcomes, um, and, but we wanted to see how they would uh, answer without us um, helping them understand ultimately some examples. It also highlights the importance of understanding uh, the need to understand your buyer's business to be successful. So another company example here, uh, Jackie mentioned company X, I'm gonna describe company Y. So for example, um, we spoke to um, yeah, seller Y company, adds as much value to the metal as possible for their customers. And what they did is they, they reaped um, and, and, and were rewarded the following. They saw a 55-0 margin improvement of their value proposition model compared to their core distribution and service center model. That was their description, by the way. And, and ultimately what that means is they um, internally organize and go to market through two different um, operating models. One, the transactional one that is pretty much par driven, a little bit more than that, but, but for the purpose of this discussion, let's just say they have a par model and then their value proposition model. They um, were able to secure and lock in their own suppliers in order to meet their customer demand, which allowed them to, um, quote unquote, own both the management of the input and output steps in their value chain. Another benefit is the increase of their company valuation, which we, we found pretty interesting because they were the only one that mentioned this because it allowed them to have improved leverage when making strategic acquisitions and investments. In other words, they, they could 
Um, their financial model compared to others gave them a lot more financial freedom to um, uh, use stock in other ways to uh, make acquisitions and purchases. And lastly, the company has been able to smooth out um, the typical but significant business peaks and valleys driven by wild swings in terms of price and cost in the commodities market. Um, notice I said smooth out, not eliminate, but it did um, allow them in return to better plan, forecast and invest. And it provides some protection in downtimes. I have not followed up with them, you know, uh, in the last you know month or two on whether you know that protection is holding up. But uh, that's something we're we're planning to follow up with. In other words, this company has been able to do two things very well that allows them to achieve the results. One, um, that they marry their output, their own output, to their customers' needs and production schedules, and those customers. Um, must be, and they were very explicit with me on this point, they must be willing to pay for the value being created and delivered. In other words, this particular strategy at this company is very specific to targeted segments and targeted customers, and they have decided to become experts in those segments and customers. I think Jackie mentioned that as well. Secondly, the company creates value by focusing on their customers' business operations with very specific concentration on the customer's total cost of the product application, which includes rejections, uh, operational efficiency, yield, and scrap reduction. And the point, again, they were very, very um, proud of the fact that all of those things really pointed in the direction of they are working to solve their customer's biggest problem, which happened to be um, when and how to apply things to reduce scrap and improve yield and improve their customers' financial outcomes as well. So in summary, you know, this, this company in particular has proven that they've become embedded or entangled, if you will, in their customers' businesses. And they know and therefore can anticipate needs of their customers and provide more finished products when they need them. And being embedded in their customer's business allows them to enhance the value they provide, which in turn makes them a more valuable partner. So like Jackie, uh, there are some um, implications uh, that I'd like to cover um, to this particular strategy. Um, first, from what we heard from the previous example for um, you know, about seller Y, one significant implication is the possibility of operating two models concurrently. Again, the transactional slash par model and the value added partnering model. It's not an unheard of proposition. In fact, many of you on this call uh, might already be doing something like this and many companies um, in other industries as well. But it does require both an understanding and an agreement that these two models, and maybe there's even a third one, for example, they need to be seen and treated internally within your organization through the lens of having different financial models and financial outcomes, different investment needs and different talent needs. Another implication uh, is talent. No surprise. According to the companies we spoke to, the skills required to move up the value chain include product management to understand a customer's business and secondly, product development, which would include um, mill experience, manufacturing experience, and application experience. And not just the skills, but the capacity of those skills at critical mass. In other words, um, hiring one person to uh, uh, solve you know, all kinds of problems for your company is probably not enough. Critical mass would mean we have enough talent to meet demand, create demand, without um, you know, running one or two people uh, into the ground and, and having them burn out. Another talent implication is having the sales folks that focus on how to solve customer problems in addition to and not just on relationships. One company we spoke to that implemented this strategy stated that their key talent in this business unit, the one that's value add, if you will, was hired from traditional product development and product management roles from companies outside of the service center world. 
And that same company says that their top salespeople spend upwards of 70% of their time meeting with customer executives to do nothing but discuss their customers' business issues so that they can work together on what's worth investing in and solving together. That's a huge change for many of those that we spoke to. And lastly, there are some potential investments that are needed as a company proceeds with moving on you know, their own value chain journey. Many consider retiring some products and services in their uh, catalog, if you will, to free up capital to make these investments, which include but aren't solely limited to new equipment, key acquisitions and key partnerships. And naturally, if the investments in new equipment are made, then the skills to operate them must also exist. So in summary, uh, this strategy is a powerful force, at least from our point of view, for sellers to secure many material outcomes for their business, as the example of Seller Y. And it is a proven one that when implemented does validate the two premises that we had when we started the study. From the examples we heard, it's clear that moving up the value chain does create meaningful differentiation for their business in a commoditized market, but it's not simple. It does require uh, a degree of stick to We spoke to a couple of companies that um, have said, you know, the following. Uh, one said, you know, we've done a lots of little things all with an eye towards the end goal and added up. We've had a, a lot of progress but it's taken three to four years to see the, the big levers we were shooting for. So that's a long time to be sticking to it. Another one um, also gave a similar example, particularly on talent and talent development, which is a key part, um, that they are two years into a, um, a talent development program focused on um, uh, negotiating and selling um, in, you know, intellectual property and insights versus um, you know, relationships. And again, uh, that, that particular company uh, stated that there's still yet more to be done. So again, you know, deliberate, but also stick to itiveness is important. Jackie, I'm going to turn it back, back over to you. No, thank you, Mark. That was great. And I think um, both of these now, you've, you've gotten a feel for what each, each of these strategies are and kind of the way we think about them as well as what we've heard that that sellers that we spoke to are doing so now we would love to hear from you all on whether your organization is already utilizing either or even both of these strategies so we want to go ahead and launch a poll and i see it's popping up right now so if you'd like to respond and say you know whether or not your organization is leveraging either of these both or, or neither at this time. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And as you're answering, I'll do a brief reminder. Um, the, that first strategy, it's all about market segmentation and then leveraging that segmentation to provide that advice and guidance. And the second one, obviously, might be a little bit more fresh in your minds, but that's all about collapsing the supply chain. All right, so I see And your some answers are anonymous. Today. <laughs> yes, your answers are anonymous. We're, we're, we're not spying on anyone. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right. I am seeing quite a few responses come through, but we can give it another couple minutes. Um, I already see some interesting things, though, that I'm excited to talk about. Well, while we wait on the, the last couple of these responses to come in, I, I know we're going to want to get to questions here in a second. We've got a couple that have come through already. Um, I might kick it to you, Jackie and Mark, to uh, answer at least the first one while we wait on a couple more responses. So, so there was a general question kind of around um, uh, technology as a whole, given that steel is an, an old industry, um, and what is the role that technology could play in the process? I know that as we went through this, um, there might have been some other strategies that were uncovered other than just these two that bubbled up to the surface. So uh, would you mind sharing anything that came out through the research that didn't um, rise to the level of these two um, in terms of strategies that sellers and organizations can begin employing? Um, maybe Jackie, we'll start with you. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And I mean, it's very interrelated. We did hear about technology quite a bit in these interviews um, when talking to sellers, specifically on e-commerce, actually. Um, it seems like a lot of the sellers we spoke to are currently investing in those types of capabilities. And because of that, we, just by the nature of the fact that we heard it so much, it to us would only you know eventually become table stakes as well right so essentially those those companies that are on the forefront of e-commerce they probably will see a bump they will probably see what will look like differentiation it will be in the short term but as the rest of the market catches up just based on the fact that we heard it so much um we didn't view it as a long-term sustainable way to differentiate yourselves, but definitely something to invest in because, you know, the competitors that, that you're facing are going there as well. Um, so that's my initial reaction to that question. I don't know, Mark, anything to add to that? Yeah, it's interesting in hearing you say that. I think we update par to include T at the end at some point and call it part because you're right, um, table stakes is one thing. But we did uncover um, you know, a couple that is a variation of, of the strategies um, specific to technology. And what I'm getting at is um, they have decided that you know, they're building their own um, apps and applications for smartphones and some other things. And they have made a significant bet on using technology as a differentiator. Um, but, you know, what they're using it and how they're using it is to make it easier to do business with them. Um, and it's kind of cool. And uh, if I can use the word sexy compared to the competition. So it's got a, a wow factor to it. It also works, by the way. Um, and ultimately what they're doing is, is, at least in, in, in my opinion, taking some of these strategies and enabling them through uh, a technology platform, the, the, um, w which is great. That's, it's pretty interesting and innovative, uh, at least at this point. Um, but there are implications. And in case you haven't heard, Jackie and I, you know, um, the, the common themes, regardless of strategy, is to um, pick one, <laughs> build a plan, execute, stick to it, and um, don't assume away the need for investing in uh, talent and other things. And in this case, the one I'm referring to, um, their biggest talent initiative uh, is, you know, having to go out and find, source, hire, and onboard um, technologists that are expert in artificial intelligence and other things, which is a totally different uh, recruiting program, if you will. And that's where they're adding capacity in terms of people. Got it. And it's interesting that you say pick one, Mark. I want to, I, I think I can end the polling and actually show everyone these results. It looks like the answers have slowed down because although you do need to be deliberate about the strategy, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're mutually exclusive. Uh, so you can see that we've got 61% saying that they're using both strategies. And that's a perfect lead in to uh, exactly what I wanted to talk about next, which is what if you combined at least these two that we've talked about here, of course, technology can be combined as well in different interesting ways. Um, so you can, I, I believe all of you can view those results right now. So pretty healthy amount that are at least using one at, or using both. And we believe that the, this hybrid approach, as you can see on the screen, if, you, if you've exited out of those poll results yet, um, the benefits can be exponential. There is actually a natural way to merge the two strategies and each one is made stronger by the existence of the other, which I'm sure is what a lot of you have found that are actually um, you know, leveraging both of them today. And, just as an aside, we'd love to hear from, from you all that have responded to the poll with, with your own experience. We're going to be doing a refresh of annually of our study. And one thing we're particularly interested in is how far along are you in your journey um, towards implementing or reaping the benefits of these strategies? And, and what are those benefits that you're seeing? 
um, because we believe that, you know, just looking at these two, the knowledge that you get from your customers' needs through that enhanced focus on segments can improve your ability to solve the problems through those more finished solutions, as, as Mark mentioned. So I think that's really interesting. And we did actually, and I'll go ahead and throw it up there, we've put together a handful of um, those steps that you might take. So this is kind of regardless if you have one strategy or both at this time, but essentially if companies are interested in taking on both, we think the way to get started is to identify and select those market segments that you're already in and you already understand, um, and then begin to develop that knowledge base of the selected segments. And then of course, as I've mentioned, leveraging that knowledge to create intimacy with your customers and provide that advice and that guidance. And then you go and you evaluate your current product and service catalog, your portfolio that might be retiring some, um, that might be adding new products that align with the segment's most pressing needs. Um, and then we always recommend that, that you do some sort of test or a pilot approach, right? So get a small number of customers or friendlies as we like to refer to them and be able to test the approach in a low risk environment that allows you to kind of hone it and get it exactly where you want before a broad launch. But I mean, based on that poll, it seems like a lot of you are already going down that path to some extent. So like I said, we'll have the, we're gonna move to questions here in a minute and I'll put our contact information up as we answer questions. Um, we would love to have some of you participate. So we, you can go ahead and just reach out to us if you're interested. Um, but and with that, I mean, I really do appreciate everyone taking their time. We, we can take some questions now. Um, those of you that answered the poll, thank you so much. And Anthony, I can, I can turn it over to you if you want to start asking some more of those questions. Thanks for already teeing up one of them for us. Yeah, no problem. And, and as a reminder to everybody, uh, you can type in some questions down there at the bottom. I, I responded to a couple along the way and we might um, get Jackie and Mark's thoughts on those as well. Um, but we got a, a couple others to, to work through here. Um, the, the one thing, I, just interestingly enough, as you guys both talked through the um, other strategies question, and, and we had these conversations with buyers and sellers last year, um, the, you know, technology, specifically the online ordering, the inventory visibility, that is, you, you know, we saw a lot of organizations having that initial spike of demand and sellers or buyers were asking for it. Um, but to, to Jackie's point, um, how, how sustainable is that when the rest of the market catches up, it, it becomes table stakes and becomes part instead of par. So um, uh, the next question we've got here is, um, as, as we think about just metal service centers in general, right, we, we know that there's, there's hundreds if not thousands of small customers that sell in, or that buy in small quantities and, and we have to sell to those, those customers as well. They're, they represent a large portion of the customer base. Um, how, how can a service center become a better supply partner in that environment? Um, some of what you're saying about deep relationships, um, do, does that imply that there are fewer or larger and larger customers and, and do we sacrifice our small customers um, as a result of that? Um, any yeah. thoughts on that, Jackie? Yeah, I think I, that's a great question. And I, I, my personal opinion is that is solved through the segmentation that I discussed earlier. So we see this actually in a lot of different industries. Um, for example, B2B companies selling to financial institutions or healthcare providers, a lot of variations in size among those industries and a lot of small customers that you really can't lose sight of. Um, so part of that strategy one is, is about the market segments and, and the opportunity within a segment in aggregate. But the other part that you do have to look at is the opportunity within an individual account. You know, obviously you can't make significant investments in all of your customers without it being overly costly, but you can in a deliberate manner make investments into segments, right? So in some ways you might disproportionately invest in, in the larger ones, those segments that are filled with um, buyers that individually have a lot of buying power, but there are still ways to get that intimacy with segments where um, they're large in terms of number of buyers, 
but small in terms of a potential revenue per buyer. And so I think that's kind of a, an interesting way to look at it and some things that we've seen that you can do with a segment like that. So think maybe a small oil and gas, something like that, um, that you can treat them with high value, but low cost interaction models. So that's where something like e-commerce becomes really valuable. You know, these people are looking for almost a self-service model to some extent, but you can always still have something like community consulting, some way to reach them all as a group that still gets you a little bit more intimate with them. Um, so that, that's my initial reaction to that. Yeah, I think what you're describing, Jackie, is um, w without naming the industry or labeling them, you know, there's there's two that you described. One is um, a one to few model, which is that high value, high touch, high intimacy. A lot of times those segments have few but very, very large buyers. And then we have the other, which is a, you know, a one to many which is gets into the, you know, what you're saying and in aggregate, it's a substantial segment worth pursuing, but we have to be a little more creative in terms of how we have meaningful and valuable touch points as part of our model to make sure that we're not um, ignoring them because again, they are important and meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Thank you guys. Um, next question, Mark, you talked about talent quite a bit throughout the process and we've got a couple of different things here. Um, one, can, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on some things organizations might need to do from an attraction and a retention standpoint for their um, existing talent? And then kind of a, a follow on to that is, um, do we have any, do you have any sense of whether companies will begin kind of shrinking the size of their sales teams or at least restructuring that in some way, um, given some of those, those talent elements that you're talking about, uh, that you, that you might have to share with us. So. Sure. R remind me of the second one as, uh, um, so I don't forget. I will do if that. You don't mind. <laughs> the good news, um, Anthony knows me well and knows I'll forget. So, um, <laughs> on the first one, you, you know, uh, retention, um, and what have you, I, I'm going to expand that a little bit, that question and, uh, answer it through the lens of, um, you know, what we typically call a talent life cycle, you know, model, if you will, which includes, um, you know, the analysis of what gaps exist compared to, you know, what do we have, which then feeds into, um, what do we need to go get, if you will, which leads to, um, a sourcing model and plan um, and then interviewing and then hiring and then onboarding and then training and development, which then also coincides with um, uh, career pathing and then retention and even exiting, right? If you think of all of those pieces parts, suddenly, you know, what we thought we have and what we need um, becomes a little bit more interesting. And each one of those steps, um, at least in, in, in my experience over the years, typically needs to get rethought, retooled and updated if we need to go find and get new talent that we haven't traditionally thought through. So for example, um, that, that one company I was referring to that has made a deliberate investment in technology, they have to go to uh, get data scientists and coders. Well, suddenly, okay, uh, that's different in terms of where are we going to go get them, right? Is it university programs? Maybe we need to partner with them. And, and so they, that changes um, that, you know, that, that whole stair-step model. And then the way we interview is probably going to be different as well, because suddenly um, we have to sell them on why they should join us. And um, this industry is probably um, a typical target for a new hire, I'm sorry, a new graduate coming out of uh, computer science. So what we say and how we message, et cetera. So that's, that's part of the, um, I hope the answer that uh, you were looking for. Um, retention, um, there's a couple of elements on that. One is, um, again, uh, career pathing and making sure large companies have the benefit of having uh, uh, more places and more avenues for 
uh, promotion, if you will, than smaller ones, right? But that doesn't mean smaller companies can't um, also become a little more creative on, you know, going outside of the norm in terms of uh, promoting and career pathing, which is really important for new people, I think, entering this industry because, um, you know, helping them stay is going to be a, um, a key strategy to be successful here um, with this new model. Um, there was a second question. Yep. The second part to that was um, specific to the sales teams um, and with an in increased mm. investment in industry expertise and, and technical knowledge, do you see any restructuring or resizing of those sales organizations taking place over time? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, again, if we, if we look at it in its most simplest um, way, at least in my mind, if we have two different operating models operating concurrently, one is transactional and part, and the other one is value add, um, you know, each one of those requires a different skill set, right? So I don't know if people feel like that's restructuring or what have you, but there are going to be people that are naturally aligned and gifted to one of those. Some people are gifted at both, by the way, but, you know, which allows them, again, from a retention point of view, um, they have a place, right? And they add value to your company. And I wouldn't um, argue that, you know, you have to let everyone go, uh, if you will, to beef up on the other side, right? So I would say do the... Um, uh, be, be deliberate on analyzing the, the, the capacity needed for each of those models and then decide uh, what kind of, um, you know, capacity do you have and how much you need to go get, if you will. Um, you know, the, the other piece to that would be uh, training and development, right? There, there are going to be some people um, that want to be in the high value model, if you will, but they're you know, classically trained in, in transaction and relationship. That's another investment that, um, you know, helps bridge the gap, if you will. Um, but we also know that um, through experience and, and having done this at a lot of clients, Anthony, that not everyone necessarily is going to make the journey, right? So, uh, you know, we should be honest and clear that, um, you know, we, we, we want and have a place for everyone, but uh, we might be uh, overutilized in, in one or both of those models. Did that, did that help? It, yeah, I, I think that, that addressed the question and I'll, I'll just tack on one additional um, thought that I have on this after going through the, the interview process with all these folks is um, I think less than a downsizing. Downsizing, of course, might occur through some shifts to e-commerce and some different things like that, but in particular to the strategies that Jackie and Mark walked through. Um, the, I think it's much more of a, that, that restructuring, right? Um, and people might not own the entire sales process like they have historically done. It might become much more of a team-based selling model. And we've got some examples of some organizations that were already doing that. So you might have lead generation resources that are different from true long-term relationship managers, which are slightly different from your subject matter experts on a particular industry or topic. They get plugged in that support the sales process, but they, they get plugged in as needed for specific clients to provide that advice and guidance along the way. Um, and so it, it might be a shift in, in focuses of skill sets more than anything else. Um, we've got time for one more question here. Um, and uh, I, I will address these other two, which are, um, Will the slides be sent out after the call? Chris can confirm that at the very end, but I believe the slides can be sent out as can our report and this recording can also be shared. Um, but the final question I've got for you, Mark and Jackie, is um, any thoughts on the, the size of organization that would be the sweet spot for these, these kinds of approaches that you guys walk through? Is it um, better for the larger uh, sellers versus the smaller sellers or, or do you think there's, there's an opportunity for everybody in this? Yeah, Mark, I might let you take a stab at this one because my, my, my first reaction is that there's opportunity for everyone regardless of your size. Obviously, it takes some investment. Um, so, I mean, that needs to be considered, but there are ways to do each of these strategies, especially the first one, 
um, in, a, in a low investment but high value way. And it's really about the investment of time rather than resources. Um, so, and that's my first reaction. Mark, I mean, what do you think about strategy two or strategy one? Is there any sweet spot for those? Yeah, I actually agree with what you just said. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I think if, if uh, I was, you know, going to pick and choose, you said it perfectly, you know, high value, relatively low cost, the um, strategy two on, you know, the value chain would require a bit more, um, I think, creativity in terms of how to enable something like that um, in a uh, low cost manner if, if my resources are constrained due to the size of my company. So I'd, I'd prioritize uh, the way you just did, strategy one, then strategy two. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I, I um, we are at the top of the hour. I will turn this over to Chris. Um, thanks to Mark and Jackie, and, and thanks to everybody that, that joined. Chris, you've got um, some closing comments for us, I believe. I do. I want to thank you guys, uh, the McMahon and Ransford team, for today's presentation. Uh, it's timely. It's interesting. And if you hopefully do get some volunteers to help with your study refresh, we can do this again after that and see what if anything has changed. So let, let's try to put that on the calendar right. for uh, later this year or, or next year. I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I agree. And I'd, I'd also add some of the questions that have popped up here. We can do it, you know, a broader study as well, Chris. Yeah, yep. Um, so to the questions about the content from, from today's session, yes, you will receive a copy of the presentation that will include uh, the links that you see on your screen right now to the study that McMahon and Ransford did. So you can get to that as well. The session has been recorded and the recording will be available on the MSCI website before the end of the week, I promise. Um, so you'll have access not only to the slides in an email, but also in 24 hours, you're going to get an email from Zoom that looks like it's coming from me. And that is going to be a request that you complete a post webinar survey. And I'd really like you to please finish the survey for us so that we can get your feedback on today's webinar, but also get feedback from you on other topics that you would like to see us present to you in the coming weeks and months. So on behalf of McMahon and Ransford, and MSCI. I want to thank everyone who joined us on the call today and have a safe rest of your day and please be well. Thank you. Thank you everyone.